Hey everyone, welcome to my office. We're gonna read more of The Boy at the Back of the Class by Anjali Q. Ralph. We're on chapter 13. And the title of this chapter is The Something That Changed Everything. That night after Ahmet had told me about his sister Syra being in the sea and not knowing if his mom and dad were alive, I had trouble getting to sleep. My mom always tells me to count sheep when I can't sleep, but I find sheep too funny. They look like clouds with legs. So I count leopards instead. They're colorful and look serious. I can't remember how many leopards I counted to, but it must have been more than 200 before I eventually drifted off. By the time the morning arrived, I was so tired and my legs moved so slowly that when I got to the bus stop, it was late and Tom and Josie and Michael had already left. I didn't really mind because getting the bus on my own is fun. I like watching people passing by on the streets outside or making guesses about the people sitting next to me. Last week, there was a huge man sitting right at the front of the bus, snoring so loudly that he was making all the windows shake. Everyone was watching him and giggling or shaking their heads at him. But what if he had been a world famous snorer on his way to the International Snoring Championships and was practicing his best snore. You just never know. That morning, I was too sleepy to look at anyone and guess stories about them, so I leaned my head on the large window and listened instead. There are always lots of noises on the bus, especially when there are lots of people going to work or trying to get to school but it's usually noises like the doors opening and closing and people ringing the bell and tickets beeping on the ticket machine. Nobody really talks to anyone else unless they're with friends or asking for a seat. Uncle Lenny says it's because we're English and English people would rather die than have to speak to someone they don't know. I think it can't be very English if that's true. The bus had t passed two stops and except for a baby who was making loud gurgling sounds, it was nice and quiet. I think everyone must have been as sleepy as me. But then at the third stop, a woman dressed in a bright yellow coat and a man dressed in a suit came and sat in front of me and picking up the free newspaper lying on both their seats, began talking loudly about all the things they were reading. At first, they talked about the economy, being broken by rich people who weren't paying their taxes and hiding all their money away in a place called offshore. Then they talked about a princess who was going out with an actor they didn't like and a famous singer who'd been arrested for hitting someone. I was starting to fall asleep again when the man suddenly said something that made me sit up in my seat and listen just as hard as I could. Oh, ain't it horrible, the man said. Look at what they're saying about refugees. Border restrictions as of next month? I knew this would happen. The woman shook her head, looking over his shoulder at the paper. Those poor people, where are they meant to go? Back to that nightmare they left behind or left to starve in France? Cheaper for us to leave them in France, said the man shaking his head. Says here the borders will be closed by the end of the month. So that's all the racists made happy then. The woman tutted. Rescuing kids out of the sea one minute and then telling them they can't be helped the next. Some of them might have family here, poor things. That should count for something. The man read the newspaper for a few more seconds and then said, well, apparently not. Says we've already taken in a few hundred. So we're not gonna take in any more doesn't matter how little they are. It was my stop. As soon as I got off the bus, I ran as fast as I could to school. My heart was beating so loudly that I could hear it in my ears, but I didn't care. If what the man said was right, then after next month, Ahmet's mom and dad would never be allowed into England and Ahmet would never see them again. I needed to tell Tom and Josie and Michael about what had just happened what I had just heard. And I had to tell them everything without Ahmet hearing. But when I reached the school gates, the bell for registration was already ringing and the playground was nearly empty. 
I ran to the classroom just before Mrs. Kahn started to take the register. She looked at me with a frown, but she didn't say anything. Where were you? whispered Josie. We waited until the second bus came. I was too out of breath to say lots of words, so I just said, slept late. That morning, Mrs. Kahn put us into two big groups so that we could write a play on the story of Romulus and Remus and then act it out. It's a legend about two baby boys whose mom hid them in a basket and sent them far away so that they wouldn't be killed by people who were jealous of them. I guess they were refugee boys like Ahmet was, except Ahmet's mom didn't put him in a basket. He came in a boat. Mrs. Khan and Ms. Hemsey and Ahmet could join the class, said Ahmet could join the class on this project. So Ahmet and Tom were put in my group and Michael and Josie were put in the other group. I was trying to think of how to let them know what I'd heard when Mrs. Khan told everyone to get a piece of colored paper and a special handwriting pen from her desk so that we could write out our own lines. I decided to take an extra piece of paper and while everyone was busy looking through their workbooks to find out which character they wanted to play, I quickly wrote a top secret message. It said this, I heard something on the bus. We mustn't tell Ahmed about it. Meet me in the library at break time. Top secret. I folded the message up until it was so small that I could hide it in my hand. And when Mrs. Khan and Ms. Hemsey weren't looking, I passed it to Tom. Tom looked around and when nobody except me was watching him, he opened it up and read it. Then he gave me a nod and pretending to need another piece of paper, went to Mrs. Khan's desk and gave Josie the note on his way back to his seat. Then I saw Josie read the note and quickly pass it to Michael, who dropped it on the floor. But luckily, everyone was too busy writing their lines to notice and he snatched it back up again. He looked over at me and gave me a thumbs up and then stuffed the top secret message into his pocket. As soon as the bell for first break began to ring and Mrs. Kahn told us to leave everything where it was, I ran to the library room and waited outside. It was the one place in school no one ever tried to go to, go into at break time. A few minutes later, Josie and Michael came running up the corridor. Tom's in the playground with Ahmet, said Josie. We can fill him in later. What did you hear? Asked Michael, his eyes wide. I quickly told them everything that the man and woman had said on the bus about no more refugees being allowed into the country. And then what Ahmet had told me about his mom and dad being left behind. I had to tell them about his sister, Syra too. I felt bad about breaking my promise, but I knew that Ahmet wouldn't mind me telling Josie and Michael about it because this was a real emergency and they were his friends too. You mean, if he doesn't find them before the end of the month, then Ahmet might never see his mom and dad again? gasped Josie. I shook my head. Not once the government shuts the border gates. Yeah, said Michael. They're like giant airport ones with loads of police and guards protecting them. And you can't go through them when they're closed or you'll get put in jail. Michael looked at his watch and pressed a button so that it lit up and showed the date. If they're closing all the gates at the end of this month, that means he's only got nine days to find them. What do we do? asked Josie. I say we tell Mrs. Kahn and Miss Hemsey. They'll know what to do, I said. Michael and Josie agreed. We ran to the staff room and knocked loudly on the door. We're not supposed to disturb teachers in the staff room at break time because that's where they go to drink lots of tea and find answers to questions that they can't find in their answer books. I know because Josie's aunt is a teacher and she told Josie who told me. But Mrs. Kahn and Miss Hemsey had told us to go and find them if something was wrong. And this something felt like the most wrong something I'd ever heard of. After a few seconds, Mr. Gaffer opened the door and looked down at us with a frown. He's the deputy head, which means he's in charge on the days Miss Saunders is away. But Miss Saunders is never away, so I really don't know what he does. Yes, he asked. 
Please, sir, we need to see Mrs. Khan and Miss Hemsey immediately, I said. It's an emergency, added Josie. Is it really? He said suspiciously. We nodded our head at least 10 times. All right, just hold on, replied Mr. Gaffer as he closed the door. Josie twisted her hair nervously around her finger and then stuffed a whole chunk in her mouth. And Michael started kicking the wall lightly as we waited. After what felt like 20 whole minutes, but couldn't have really been more than one, Mrs. Kahn and Miss Hemsey came to the door. Is something the matter? Asked Mrs. Kahn. Is it to do with Ahmet? We all nodded again. Miss Hemsey and Mrs. Kahn stepped out into the corridor and closed the office, the staff room door behind them. We all started talking at once. Mrs. Kahn held up her hands and said, calm down, calm down. Now, one at a time, please. Miss, the government are going to close the gates, I began. Josie said, and Ahmet's mom and dad are on the other side. They might get stuck. And there's only nine days until the gates close, said Michael, showing Mrs. Kahn his watch. Mrs. Kahn and Miss Hemsey looked at each other and then looked back, to, back at us. What do you mean by gates? Asked Mrs. Kahn gently. You know, the gates at the edge of the borders, said Michael. The ones where all the police with all the guns are. The refugees have to come through them to get into the country. Ah, oh, said Mrs. Kahn. And where did you hear that they were going to be closed? Was it on the news? I told her about the man and the woman on the bus. I see, said Mrs. Kahn. She was quiet for a moment, and I saw her give Miss Hemsey a look. Then she said, Ahmet is a lucky boy to have such caring friends, but you don't have to worry at all. His foster mother, who you've seen coming to pick him up every single day after school, is there to look after him, and his friend, his family can be found. And she's working with some very clever people to try and help Ahmet find his family as quickly as possible. We all looked at each other in surprise. So the woman in the red scarf was Ahmet's foster mom. Everything was beginning to make sense and all our questions were being answered too. Clever people like who, miss? Asked Michael. Well, clever people from the government, said Mrs. Kahn. And lawyers and some wonderful kind-hearted ministers who are working in parliament and charities too, said Miss Hemsey. That's right, agreed Mrs. Kahn. They're doing everything they can do to make sure Ahmet's mum and dad are found. That's their job. But... What if they don't find the family before they close the gates, I asked. Miss Hemsey and Mrs. Kahn smiled, but they didn't smile with their whole faces, so I knew right away that they were just pretend smiles. Everyone is doing everything they can, said Mrs. Kahn again. Miss Hemsey nodded, and then, looking at me, said, Ahmet spoke to you about his family. And what happened to his sister? I nodded, but suddenly felt nervous. I had promised Ahmet that I would keep it a secret and I hadn't. Miss Hemsey smiled and said my name softly. That's a very good thing, she said. A very, very good thing. The bell rang and Mrs. Khan made us promise not to upset Ahmet by talking about the border gates or telling anyone about his sister. We all promised. And Mrs. Khan said, everything will be fine, you'll see. I nodded, but I didn't think she sounded very sure. In fact, I didn't think everything was going to be fine at all. Not if Ahmet didn't find his family before the gates closed. That afternoon, we told Tom what had happened and we all came to a decision. We were going to try and help instead. And to do that, we would have to go on our first ever top secret mission. That's the end of chapter 13. Chapter 14 next time. Bye.